a special episode of the Reflection Podcast today. In just a few short weeks will be the presidential election of 2024. Some are saying that this is the most important election in our nation's history. I've heard even people say that this could be the last election in our nation's history. Well, I wanted to talk about that and other things with Greg Seltz, who is the director of the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty in Washington, D.C. And so here's my conversation with Greg. I hope you really enjoy it and uh, find a lot of information here about being a Christian in the United States in the 21st century. Stay tuned after the episode, and I'll tell you how you can get in touch with Greg and some of the resources that we're going to talk about on this episode of the Reflection Podcast. In the pastor's office with me today, returning to the pastor's office, Greg Seltz. Thanks for joining me again today, Greg. It is great to be here with you, Ed. We are going to, um, if you want to know more about Greg, you can go back to the previous episode in season one, uh, where we we, we got a, a, a great introduction into Greg and his ministry mm -hmm. uh, and what he's doing these days. So can you give us just a little bit, uh, a brief synopsis of who you are and where you are right now? Well, again, uh, I, I represent the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty. I'm the exec director here, and it's the voice of the LCMS in Washington, D.C. We're here to in, encourage those on the Hill who actually represent us or represent some of our ideals. We're also here to advocate for religious liberty, sanctity of life, marriage as an institution, and educational freedom. Uh, and also, we're, we're creating what's called a Champions for Liberty network around the country. And I have a new staff member, Reverend Mark Fifth, who is really growing that, where we educate people how to use their temporal liberties in service to the gospel without politicizing the church. In fact, we take politics out of these things. And I'm also a radio guy now in D.C. So that's one of the ways to get our voice amplified here, because we're really kind of small compared to some. <laughs> well, I'm glad you're back in the radio. I, you were a Lutheran Hour speaker for a, for a while there, and mm -hmm. you've got uh, a voice for radio. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I, I didn't say a face for radio. That, okay, like... I appreciate it. I appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So what I wanted to do, have you come back on the show, because I do want to talk specifically about uh, a couple topics Especially uh, as we record this, I'm thinking about I want to use this closer to the election. Uh, in 2024, we have a presidential election, and there are many voices out there uh, in the United States saying that not only is this the most important uh, election for president that the United States has seen either in a long time or ever, but it uh, there are some voices saying it could be the last uh, depending on how it goes. I mean, right. liberty is certainly on the ballot, according to a lot of people here. So mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about one of the things that came up, especially uh, as Christians, as those who follow Jesus Christ. Right. Uh, we have been uh, accused now, uh, members of the Church of Jesus Christ, no matter what denomination you happen to be in, mm -hmm. uh, in the Christian Church in America, we have been accused of being Christian nationalists, and uh, and that is a pejorative as it's being used. So I thought, can Greg give us a little bit of insight into what that means? What what exactly is a Christian nationalist, and why are we being accused of it? Well, and see, and that's the that's the issue. What's wrong with that? I mean, honestly, it, nationalism versus uh, globalism. I I would say I'm a nationalist. Um, there's peculiar kinds of nationalism, but if, if America is a, a unique place. Uh, our president should undergird the rights of Americans because he represents us as a nation. So the word nationalism, I guess, if it's properly understood and it's properly protecting the freedoms of individual people, I guess it's not a bad. Maybe uh, national socialism is a bad term. So that's bad nationalism. But, it, you know, constitutional limitation of government nationalism sounds like a great place to live. Well, then the pejorative must be Christian. And see, I think that's exactly what people are doing. And remember who's accusing us. I always have to ask who are the accusers. Rob Reiner did a movie on this already. Um, the person, One person came up on, on the Hill and said, there are people who actually believe that their rights come from God. Those nationalists, Christian. Well, I hated to tell that person on the Hill, but that's the Declaration of Independence. 
you, you know, you want to say you're a moron, but see, they don't think of themselves that way. They think we've moved past these things. And so you are a kind of person who's going backwards. You're going back to these kinds of things. And so now the negative is that Christianity is a real pejorative. It's a very negative thing. I, I prefer to think of myself as a C.S. Lewis progressive. You ready? Here's a good okay. quote for you. A C.S. Lewis said, the person who's re progressive is the one who turns around when you're going down the wrong road, turns around the quickest. That's the one you want to follow because the rest of these people are going over the edge of what I call secular globalism. And that is a bad place for citizens to be. So again, as you break it down, the first question is why would they charge us with this it's because in the movies and the media those who are christian you know they're to be feared well the the biblical so again the question is well here's the other side of that they are trying to say we're like the theocracies of the middle east or something like that. that's the, they're trying to build that in and i look and i say I, i've been on the hill seven years i've never heard one christian even the most ardent public voice of Christianity on the Hill. I've never heard them say the state should coercively um, make people believers in Jesus. It, it's just they, everybody says, no, that's not the state's job, but they have a moral view of the state. And what these people who are claiming that we're nationalists are doing is they're just trying to confuse the issues so that we argue about it among ourselves, because we're not a theocracy. None of us believe in that. But what they're doing is by the time while they're doing, you know, while we're arguing, they're taking power. That's what I see happening on the Hill. Okay. So I don't know if that's a good way to start this discussion. Yeah, I think it is. OK, uh, because it's a tactic. It is. It is a tactic. And I and I do want to talk about um, Karl Marx and Saul Alinsky. Yeah, uh, because I think that they that there's something to be said about especially the the language and 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 taking that I do. I do get the. Um, the criticism, I understand where some of that is coming from, because certainly the Christian church did coerce people to become Christians. Uh, it was in time. Uh, yeah. Yeah. In, in the past, in, in our history, it was the, the Inquisition uh, was was part of that movement. And of course, that did um, come to sort of an end, although I maybe it isn't. Uh, so, I mean, that office. You're going maybe, a long way back, my friend. I am. <laughs> But I mean, that, if we're going to start talking about what people did 400 years ago. <laughs> well, the, but still, that it is exactly sort yeah. of the, the the tactic that's used is that say you you did this in the past, so that must be you. Um, yeah. You you talk about political candidates. Oh, there this person is immoral because he did this 30, 40, 50 years ago, and it's like. Uh, <laughs> You know, well, here's what I do. But see, again, in order to really, un if if this were that kind of discussion, I would agree with you. And then we would have a dialogue about it. And the way to actually end that dialogue, or to at least clarify it, is to say, what's on your platform? What do you expect the government to do? You just pointed out that at one point in time, there was one state, you know, the Spanish Inquisition, and they were forcing people. And then there was a monolith going on in Europe until Luther broke it apart because exactly. of his clarity of the gospel. But again, when you're thinking about that, so you're, the question is, does the state have the coercive power to force you to believe? Or does the state have the coercive power to force your conscience uh, to be, uh, you know, to make you do what you don't want to do? And the answer in America, because no, and it's never been that way. And everybody who signs on to constitutional limitation of government believes that. Yep. Except, and here's the point, except the new secularists who use coercive power of government to force you to believe, to force you to use these pronouns, to force you to say these kinds of things, to force you to agree that all these sexual practices are fine, to force you to come up with a different view of marriage. Who's using the coercive power of government to force something upon you? It's not us. And so in reality, they're actually hoist, foisting this on us to smear us while they're doing exactly that. And so look at the platforms and ask, wow, your, your platform actually is fascist. It's, it's using the state to tell me what to do in my own home. And, and to give right. you a good example of this, just so you know that I'm not hyperbolizing, look what's happening to the kicker from Kansas City. Yeah. And he said, so I, let me, can we go further on that right now? Absolutely, please Okay. Do. So I was asked about that. What do you say, Pastor? You know, someone says, what, because a, a person was wearing the jersey now. I guess that jersey's selling out. 
Yes, the most okay. popular jersey in the NFL right now. Right. And so typically, if you start to get into a conversation with someone with whom you disagree about this, you're going to go right to what's your view of marriage? What's your view of humanity? Blah, 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 blah. And I said, don't start there. Go back to, do I have the right to have this view in my home? Okay, that's the first thing. And then if I have the right to have it in my home, how about a school that has the same principles? Do I have the right to speak about it at that school? And the answer is, of course. And I wouldn't force you to believe in your home what you're telling me I shouldn't believe in my home. Well, guess what they're saying? They're saying he spoke it at this university, and this is his home view of things, which is a beautiful thing, by the way, and we're going to cancel him. Now, who is being the fascist? So, And then on top of that, you're starting to hear these whispers, he's one of those Christians. Right. And then the question is, are we going to defend that marriage is a beautiful thing or not? Are we going to defend God's moral truths or beautiful things or not? And that's where a lot of this is going. And, the, and we live in a libertine, no one can tell me no culture. And so we're going to be out of step with that. The, um, the, the connection that I, when I first wanted to, start, first started reaching out to you to have this conversation, I had been reading a book called Letter to the American Church. And it was kind of based on right. what uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer had, had made his mission in the early 1930s in Germany. Um, and basically, I guess to, to pare it down, is he wanted the church to stand up and speak Correct. against the National Socialists, the, the Nazi Party and Adolf Hitler, and couldn't get anybody to do it. Right. Um, and I'm wondering if we have maybe stepped into history repeating itself here in the 21st century America. And that's why I think you have to be clear about all these terms. And, and I think right. what they're trying to do is, it, it, no, like, let's go even to the uh, pronoun debate. What's the purpose of that? It's to confuse and cause chaos, because if I don't even know how to address you, I can't talk to you. I don't know if you're a they, a he, a she. I don't even know these are created. And so even if you say, well, they are coming to my house, you're going, are there multiple people coming to my house or just one person coming? No, this is a real thing. And they're creating chaos in language so that you can easily be told where to go and what to do. And I think that's what's happening in this debate. So the first thing is you got to clarify the language. What are we talking about? You know, if it's abortion or are we talking about, uh, what do they call it, um, um, medical freedom or, you know, reproductive freedom. Well, I don't know what reproductive freedom is, but I'm talking about this act right here and right. the government coercing that act on people. What are we talking about? And that's the thing with this nationalism. What what are we talking about? And then when you get to what we're talking about, then you can have a conversation. But what we're here's who we're dealing with. We're not dealing with liberals and conservatives anymore. Liberals and conservatives classically believe there were truths that we actually believed in, and we held them together. Now, they had a more liberal understanding of how to do it. Maybe they even had this hint of benevolent government, which I think is an oxymoron. We had more like, no, the government's limited, and our families and our churches do that kind of thing. The people we're dealing with on the Hill are what we call secular leftists. They don't believe there's any truth. There is no God. The state defines everything, and they make everything political. And they hate liberals and conservatives. Who believe in truth. So if you're listening out there, folks, and you're being, you know, dragged into this conversation, at least understand who's the one dragging you. They're dragging you into this conversation to nullify your voice. And the Christian church has a voice about what Caesar's supposed to do. And so we not not, you know, we don't have a big voice there. We tell Caesar to do what he's told to do. But once we've done that, the rest of it's on us to be good citizens. And, and that's how our founders actually understood it. So Maybe let's let's uh, look at that for a bit. Uh, I have a question um, that I think is it, it may not be being asked, but it, I think the question is underlying a lot of this debate and this conversation that we're having. Are we and have we ever been a Christian nation? You know, the mm -hmm. founding in 1776 uh, mm -hmm. and then the um, Constitution being ratified that really was the birth of this. Uh, constitutional republic. Correct. Have we ever been a Christian nation? Are we one now? And the, and the answer to that is, I think, pretty simple. It's always been a nation of Christians. See, again, you see what they do to us. They say it's not a Christian nation. You say, what do you mean by that? They say, well, there's no mention of God in the Constitution, and that's true. And then Christians start fighting with each other. We're not a Christian nation. He wasn't a very good Christian, just like they're doing with Donald Trump now. They're saying he's not a good Christian. Why are you Christians voting for him? And I'm saying, 
is Joe Biden a better Christian? <laughs> is that the issue of that I'm dealing with? No, the issue is what kind of president is he and what's the use of power that he's espousing. But it's interesting because if you look at how the founders understood it, they understood that this was a nation of Christians. And so to actually free them, to free Christians so that they would be religiously motivated people who, who would be self-governing and morally directed, they limited the government. And that's why you don't see any notion of God in the Constitution, because the Constitution is limiting this powerful government to the few basic things it's supposed to do. So it's, I kind of look at it. You're in Chicago, right? Yes. You're the pothole city of America. <laughs> okay. If we, limit, if we limit government, just let's be silly. If we limit government to one thing, fill potholes, do you have to have a Christian do that? No. no. And so we're limiting that government. We've defined how it is. We put it in their place so that the rest of the life that they live is to be lived by their faith in service to their neighbor. So we've always been a constitutional limited government in service to free Christians uh, so that they can live their lives in freedom and make a huge difference in society. So we've always been a nation of Christians with a constitutional limited government. The uh, There are a lot of people who don't understand maybe have never even read the U.S. Constitution. Correct. And I have here uh, a quote that may trigger some people, um, but this is this is a, a quote. Uh, it's called, Congress shall not shall make no law establishing a uh, respecting an establishment of religion or mm -hmm. prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Yeah, or, that's the one they forget about right there. Yeah. Okay. Or abridging the freedom of speech, right? Or of the press, or of the right to of the people peaceably to, to assemble, assemble, and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. grievances. Mm -hmm. That's the that's the very first amendment of the Constitution of this of this country, the, the United States. It is that there is, and it, it's often called the freedom of religion. Yeah, not necessarily the freedom from religion, although that can be a part of it. Well, and they're, they're or you did not be a, religious. Yeah, <laughs> but except, except well, let me say something because sure. a lot of times people forget that the the founders knew that if we you were not a religious person, that eventually if we were not religious people, which is what's happening in our country today, you couldn't because there has to be some reason why you do the right thing, and right. and the secularists are saying, well, I can just do that because. I want to do the right thing. Well, look at what's happening. If I, if there is no standard and there is no right, there is no wrong, then what is the right thing is whatever makes me happy. And the founding fathers would have said that is a recipe for disaster because you have to be a self-governing people. Well, that's why your faith was so important to them. And so exactly this, the First Amendment was about limiting the coercive power of the federal government from getting in your way. Well, look at what COVID-19 did. It yeah. violated everything there. Yes. It, it literally did. One governor was asked about this, and he went, oh, I never thought about it. It was amazing. They said, you're violating our freedom to assemble. You're violating our freedom to go pray about this thing. You're violating our freedom to gather. You're violating for our, to preach against this because there are people who say that what you're doing is actually wrong or there's a better way to do it. Uh, what was that, the Barrington um, Agreement, which is one I signed about epidemiologists. Who's, so all of this stuff, they violated that. And I remember one of the governors saying, oh, I never thought about it. Well, that's the very reason why this document was written. Yep. Not only shouldn't should you have thought about it, but we should have exercised it upon you, yep. so that we could do, we could make the, the decisions we had to live with uh, for the sake of our neighbors. So that is the First Amendment, folks. Just understand, it's to protect the religious citizen to freely exercise their lives in service to their neighbors. And the founders thought that was the better way to organize a government. They thought if we have a free relationship with God in our relationship with him, even, even Jefferson, probably the most secular of them, talked about the beauty of Jesus and the beauty of his laws and the beauty of, his, of, of who he was, and he went to church every Sunday. Yes, he did. Okay? And so my point is, is that they thought those people motivated that way and directed that way, that, that's going to be the best culture you can do. And even people coming into this culture who may not be Christian would be free to be here because tolerance is a fruit of this right way of thinking. So, Yeah, uh, interesting that you bring up Jefferson, who many people vilify or at least throw up there, oh, he didn't believe in Jesus, he, he was a deist. 
He did go to church every Sunday. Yeah. Do you remember where he went to church every Sunday? In the Capitol. In the Capitol. In on the, the Capitol. It was the largest church in America. <laughs> yeah, they wrote this thing, which they say is supposed to be free from religion. Then why was the largest church in America in the Capitol? And Jefferson went every Sunday. Yeah. You know, it, and it the, was, you it know, wasn't I, well, the only one either. Uh, many, no, no, no. Yeah, for a hundred and what, some odd years. That yeah, yeah, it was they, huge. They met. Yeah, and the thing for me on that is there's a book called Doubting Thomas uh, by Jerry Newcomb. You ought to read it. I, I'm just starting it because he's saying, you know, even this view of Jefferson, I hadn't thought about this, but, you know, I, as remember, he took all the uh, um, miraculous out of the Bible, the Jefferson Bible. And I said, what if that's the Bible he wanted you to have if you're a legislator? You see, that's a whole different perspective. It, it, he's so again, we, you know, my my role here in D.C. is not to preach the gospel. Now, I'm not. I'm not. That's not what I do. My job is to morally engage the the government to to keep them doing the right things morally and to prevent them from doing the wrong things morally. Because all law is a moral thing. So if the policeman stops you and says you drove 65 and it's 55, he's he's making you. He's saying you were immoral to this degree, and I'm going to give you a ticket. All law is what morals we're saying publicly we're going to live by and execute so we can have a civil society. Well, what if he got rid of all the miraculous and said, well, here's some of the laws you should be thinking about if you're going to be a legislator. Now, again, I think that's probably overstating Jefferson's Bible. At least even there, he's saying this is the backstop that none of us will go past. Right. And so we're so far past that backstop <laughs> in public morality and virtue that they would be shocked today. Yeah, it's he, and Jefferson is often held up at that, but like I said, um he went every Sunday every on Sunday. the floor of the House of Representatives. <laughs> they they met. In fact, there were more people, there were more churches. It wasn't just just one church. Oh, they right. In the um when the um Supreme Court used to meet in the Capitol building before it had its own building, they met in that area statutory hall is where the, the house used to meet, and that's where uh, those services were. Right. Uh, talking about Jefferson a little bit, <laughs> um, he quotes the, he, he didn't write the First Amendment, um, mm -hmm. the U.S. Constitution, but he certainly, at the very least, took an oath to uphold it. Signed on. Uh, yeah. And when he became president, um, he was, uh, there, there was a letter sent to him uh, from Connecticut by a group of pastors, the Danbury Baptist mm -hmm. uh, clergy or whatever committee. And uh, they were a little bit worried. And so right away, even as the Constitution is is implemented and the United States is maybe 10 years old, already there, there is some question, though, is the government going to designate or, or, or you know, yeah. dictate to us exactly how we can worship or if we right. can worship? And Jefferson had to tell them, no, religion is a matter which lies solely between man and his God, that he owes account to none other for his faith in him or his worship, that the legislative powers of government reach actions only and not opinions. I contemplate with sovereign reverence that act of the whole American people, which declared that their legislature would make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, thus building a wall of separation between church and state. And of course, that is where the phrase comes from. Right. Uh, it's not in the Constitution, but everybody seems to think it is. Well, and not only that, they 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 have the wrong opinion of what it means. Yes. So go ahead. I, I didn't want yeah. to cut you off. Well, Sorry. well, and then in the early 20th century, the Supreme Court lifted those, what, eight verses, uh, eight words out of there, the, the a wall of separation between church and state, ignored mm. the rest of the letter and said, now you can't pray in school. Yeah, to, to misapply it to yep. a constitutional issue and to say it in such a way that it actually flips the First Amendment upside down. Yeah. So, again, this is kind of the when you break apart Christian nationalism, define what nationalism is, define what Christian is. And if the Christian worldview actually supports the uh, the freedom of more people than every other worldview, then Christian nationalism would be a good thing. Well, it's the same thing with the proper understanding of the First Amendment. So a lot of times when people say separation of church and state, here's what I say. Ready? I say, oh, I didn't know you were a Christian. <laughs> and they go, what? you know, because it's usually used by secularists to say, get out of my business. And I look at them and say, no, no, it's actually uh, Je even Jefferson 
we don't use the word separation because that implies that they're two distinct things that have no inter interplay. We use the word differentiation. And I said, that goes back to Jesus because they tried to trap him in this thing in Matthew 22 about a tax issue and say, he says, give me a coin, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's. Later on before Pilate, Pilate says, I could do whatever I want to you. And Jesus says, no, you really can't. You know, John 18, you only have the authority that God the Father gives you. And so the point is, is that Caesar's got a role in our life. And, and obviously Jesus, God's son, his answer, give to God what is God's, but it's God at work in both Caesar and in his per, the person work of his son. And the founders put Caesar on the bottom yes. and put the church on the top. If you keep it properly differentiated that way, I got no problem with anything we talk about. The problem today is the secularists, the statists are putting the state on the top and putting the church on the bottom and claiming separation of church and state is the reason to do that. So again, they're taking something that is actually beautiful, differentiation of church and state. You don't want the state preaching the gospel, and you don't want people uh, putting being put in jail for not putting their money in the offering plate. You know, th these are the things we can differentiate their, how they do things and what they do. Oh, and by the way, the chaplains in the military, beautiful. Where did that come from? Proper differentiation of church and state. We need spiritual leadership on the battlefield, but they don't shoot you. That's not their vocation. Their vocation is to be there when you get shot. Their vocation is to be there when all hell is breaking loose and you realize there's a God bigger than even this. So the founders got all this, and these secularists and this idiot judge that you just mentioned, you know, the, the Supreme Court, um, they decided that they'd flip it upside down. And so really the biggest issue for me on the Hill is to turn it, you know, put the state back in its proper place, put it back on the bottom of this discussion and set the church free. And the First Amendment protects the church, not the state. Yeah. And so that kind of leads me to this question is, uh -oh. <laughs> what can we do about this as Christians? I mean, should we vote as Christians? And, yeah. and is that our place? Or well, do we not I, talk I, about this at all? I'm going to go even further. I'm going to go, okay, so give to Caesar what is Caesar's. We still, when we pray in church, I've said this, we're, we're still not really applying the, look, the, the Bible was written at a time when there was no such thing as citizenship. Paul had, Paul was a Roman citizen, but I would say the better word is Roman subject. Right. You know, he had certain protections, but he couldn't go into Caesar's office and give him a, you know, I got news for you kind of thing, right? They would have killed him. But he did use his citizenship to protect himself from some nonsense. Okay, so we teach, put your citizenship to work, put your temporal liberties to work for the sake of the mission of the church. All right, well, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. In the American Constitution, who's Caesar? The citizen. Yep. Wait a minute. So when you're praying for your governor and you're praying for your president and you think of them as above you, not in the American constitutional experiment, they're not. So I would say that the founders actually said, what we really want you people to do is to take your Caesarship. We're going to give the citizen the, that kind of power, never in human history. But we also understand that you, you have you know individual dignity, but you also have sinful. You're broken. The founders believed in depravity. And so they said, so you're going to have to be motivated by something, to course by something. And they thought that's what your faith and that's what your moral and virtues are. But you're the one who's the Caesar of your own house. So I always thought, you know, the governor, he's the one who cuts your grass. The mayor, he's the one who does your garden. Well, the mayor wants to live in your house. The governor wants to take over your mansion. The capital is the, is the citizen's house. And COVID made it look like it was their house, and we were just lucky to come in there. So you're seeing the, you're seeing the shift to kind of a more of a monarchical, oligarchical view of, of government. And I'm saying, folks, the founders gave you the citizenship responsibility. So not only vote, but run your life, run your neighborhood, be a part of this, set up boys clubs and girls clubs so that, you know, we can actually serve the poor in our neighborhood. We don't need the government to do any of those things. Educate your kids. Why are you letting the, the, why are you letting the federal government educate your children? Don't do it. Take that money back. Actually start your own schools because for the first 150 years or so, every school was parochial. Yes. So we've let them take these things away from us. And that's basically Caesar, you know, the old ugly Caesar, you know, rearing his ugly head. And the First Amendment is supposed to push back on that. But these guys are pretty smart. They know how to get around that stuff. When um, 
we look at this as um, who is actually supposed to be in charge. Right. I think that as citizens of this constitutional republic, we abdicated and said, yeah. go well, ahead and let the yeah. government do it, you know, and just leave me alone, you know, get off my lawn, right? But, but, but <laughs> they're yeah. in the lawn, they're on the lawn, they're in the front room. Well, and you're right, but we've also let, we, we I guess they've appealed to our own, you know, almost every person I deal with on the Hill is like, it's my right, it's my, 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 my. So they've appealed to our sense of uh, self, where as long as I feel like I get to do what I want to do, well, that's being used to manipulate you into being part of the crowd. And, and when you're part of that crowd, they will keep you in your place. And the founders knew that. You know, they, if you look at the Constitution, too, there's the tyranny of the monarchy, but there was also the tyranny of the mob. Yeah. And they protected us from both tyrannies. It's, uh, they were geniuses. And I look at all of that and I say, we're abdicating that. I don't know what, why you would. I want to be a good father to you know, my daughter. I want to be a good husband to my wife. I want to be a good family member to my family. You start in those places and go to church and run your own business. If we do more of that um, and take responsibility for life, Rights are just something to, you know, be undergirded so that we can do those things. A lot of people are saying, I'd prefer you actually live my life for me. I just don't know that you want to be that citizen on 50 years from now. It's easier. That's for sure. Until, for now. Until it isn't, right. For now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was easier in East Germany. Yeah. Until you did. You know, that's the one thing about socialism. You know, Thomas Sowell says this. He said, it sounds so wonderful. It just sounds beautiful. Everyone. Each according to his the need, uh, or each from his ability according to his needs. Some it just sounds beautiful, except for the fact that human beings are sinful, and that's why sy all this talk about systemic racism and all that is it's a cover again because sinfulness is not just systems; it's individual hearts. Well, they're they're actually diminishing that, coming up with this notion of systemic, and then the only system that really is beautiful is socialism. But guess what? Look at the history of it. You all will be as miserable as the other person. That's socialism. Well, and um, yeah, yeah, that I mean, you look at the book of Acts, uh, the church kind of tried that, you know, that everybody had everything in common and what everybody owned, that was everybody's. But then you never hear about that again. <laughs> and and but even that and I've had some people say the Bible's socialistic because of that passage. And I said, did you hear any coercive use of government in there? That's right. No, see, you're missing the whole point of socialism. It's not about they had this common faith, and then they brought everything in common, and they said, let's take care of each other. And then, So again, if Christ is motivating me to give this away and to give all this towards that, I, I got no problem with that. Go right ahead. But what the government's view of that is, benevolent government is this oxymoron where it's beautiful if you're motivated by it, but if you're not motivated by it, we're going to take it anyway. And, yeah. and th that's a big difference between what is going on in Acts and what Karl Marx is talking about. Yeah. Um, the, when the um, uh, Plymouth Colony was yeah, they tried. It. They tried it too, <laughs> right? It didn't work. Yeah, because yeah. well, be, then again, because if you're a sinner and you realize I don't have to work very hard, because if he works hard, I'll get his stuff anyway. It starts to actually incentivize. It, someone asked me one time, "Is capitalism a Christian thing or not?" And I said, "Well, again, you're talking about." I get, we should have talked about left-hand kingdom, right-hand kingdom. Sure. When you talk about God's preserving work in the world, it's all law. There's no gospel in it, and there's no ultimate solution there. There's just trade-offs. And so when God's preserving the world, is, is, he, is he doing it better through capitalism or socialism? And the answer is pretty simple. Which mitigates human being sinfulness the, the most? Well, if I, gotta, if, if I have to sell you something and you have to agree to buy it for the price I want and the price you want to pay, and a thousand of us do that, that's capitalism. Well, it mitigates your greed and my greed, you know, by coming up with an agreement. Socialism is one guy tells everybody what's going to, what the price is and what's not. Well, if you put that much power in one person and he's a sinner, yikes. And so the difference is not whether one's from the Bible and one's not from the Bible in some beautiful Shangri-La, it's which one mitigates sinfulness the best. And that's kind of where we go with our government stuff. So, I'm 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 hearing you say that Christians should vote. <laughs> oh yes. Did I yeah. yeah. Well, because if you're the Caesar, you 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 better be voting for what Caesar should be doing. Yeah. Right. 
you should take responsibility. It is a yeah. it's a right and a privilege uh, to be able to do that and do it while you can. And responsibilities, you just put that's the great word. No one talks about responsibilities today. Every right is an is a responsibility for action. That's and right. people are saying, I have the right, but I don't need to actually be accountable for the action. I you mentioned left king versus right uh, left yeah. kingdom versus right kingdom, and it's interesting how the Bible also um, picks up on that and how that is almost woven into the fabric of of the nation. Um, right. David Barton um, has a, a website, Wall Builders, and mm -hmm. I use that quite a bit for resources. Yep. And uh, he said this on this on on uh, one of his um, uh, essays on that is the concept of the separation of church and state actually originates in the Bible, where yeah. God created three institutions. In Genesis, He established the institution of family by right. creating male and female and placing them together in a lifelong union. I just caused a lot of people's heads to explode with that. Exactly. Comment. Yeah. <laughs> Next came the institution of civil government to address our relationship with our fellow man. And the final institution addressed our relationship with God and was the creation of the temple in the Old Testament or the church in mm -hmm. the New Testament. That, and so it just makes so much sense, but I don't know that we're actually talking about these things yet. Well, and I'd even go further. I'd say the first two institutions, I would, you know, the temple, but I would say, obviously, God was the center of the garden. So church and family were in the garden. Yes. So they are the, you know, and I guess, well, I can't say family is necessarily an enduring thing because it's going to be magnified somehow differently in heaven. But the one that will fall away completely in heaven is the state because it's got it's God's emergency institution after human beings brought sin into the world. And they became so evil that God had to set up a backstop and say this far and no farther. Genesis yeah. 9, the noatic. Uh, covenant where you know God says, but if you shed man's blood, your blood will be shed. Why? Not because of revenge, but because human life is that precious. And so I'm going to set up this thing called the state, and they're going to bear the sword. So the main role of the state, Romans 13, is to is people who will not live as even if as civilly humane people on the outside. I don't even know what your heart is saying, but I'm going to at least demand that you be civil and humane and law-abiding, even if you don't want to. Um, the state's role is to keep all hell from breaking loose because it can. So I always tell people, when they talk about separation of church and state, just, just think of it this way. Give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's, and God is working through both. Okay. What is he doing through Caesar? He preserves his will. What does he do through moms and dads and vocations? He preserves his world. These could even be sinners. They could, these could even be non-believers. But if they're doing what the vocation says, then God can salt the world. He can keep it all hell from breaking loose so that people can hear the message of salvation, which he does alone through Jesus Christ. So think of the state's role of putting—I always say—I try to come up with analogies. Their job is to put a foundation in. Every house is built on a foundation. Uh, a liberal might say it only needs to be a slab, you know. So in Florida, they only got slabs, but up in up in Minnesota, they got basements. <laughs> so so again, that could be the conservative has a basement, the liberal has a slab, but they both know you got to put a foundation in, and that's all we should expect from government. The rest is you building your house in faith, in love, in service. Yeah, the the, the United States as a constitutional republic. Um, many people will say that, you know, God established this. You've got the, um, uh, when, uh, and I forget the name of the pastor, um, that about the city on a hill, um, who talked yeah, about uh, the Tocqueville and he, but he talked about, he, it was a phrase used when the, a bunch of, uh, uh, the Plymouth colony wanted to set up Boston and you, you were setting up a city on the hill and Kennedy quoted it, Reagan quoted it. Um, this country is established, I believe, and this is my belief, that God established this so that mm -hmm. more and more people could hear the gospel of Jesus. That isn't their job to, to proclaim Jesus. That would be, I think, what we're at, accused of doing as Christian nationalists, that we're going right. to set up some kind of theocracy. But the government actually just sets up the freedoms, the limited government, so that the citizens have freedoms to do the pursuit of happiness, and in a Christian, the pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness is to right. proclaim the gospel. And if we don't speak, and if we don't vote as Christians, and if we don't take a, 
our part in this process. We will, in this country, lose the right to be able to speak up. We will never stop speaking up, but we may find ourselves incarcerated because we have. But mm -hmm. at the moment, we still have the freedom to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Let's not give that up, at least not without a fight. And and then, the, the and I agree with everything you said. And the other thing is people need to understand that what's under attack in America today is God's law. Okay, just period. And so when you proclaim God's law, honor your father and your mother, oh, that makes means that this relationship is unique, and there's something that I need to defend about this, and there's something built into this that's a blessing to society. Father, mother, child, that's the the trinity of civility, I call it, you know, even if it's practiced by non-believers. So when you start to defend these things, that means God is saying this is right and this is not, okay? Well, guess what? Our society is nobody tells me what to do ever, even God. And if you tell me that, and you're just as sinful as I am, you can see where we're getting into the entanglements today. But when I start to fight for these things on the Hill, as long as I try to say, no, no, this is good for you. I'll give you an example. I was at the Dobbs uh, event after it was, you know, Roe was overturned and people were screaming bloody murder. And I was in the middle of the crowd and all these kinds of things. And I just wanted to hear what they were saying. <laughs> And there was this Democrat for life. He had a sign, Democrats for life. And he was getting browbeat because they were screaming at him. You took our rights away. You took our rights away. So I went and stood with him. We you know, were arguing, well, dialoguing. I just finally said, and I use this all the time because it just blew me away. I said to this group of people we were arguing with, I said, why do you think we are here? See, see, that's the point. This is God's law. I get it. This is proper understanding of government. I get it. So why do you think we're here? I mean, we just won. Why don't why aren't we out partying? He said, Well, I thought you're here to rub our noses. And these girls say, Yeah, you don't care about us. You you massage. And I said, No, listen to your your congressmen, your senators. They're saying the state has a right to declare innocent human life as not worth living, happens to be in the womb here. But it could be when you're 80. It could be if you're ideologically out of step, because this is what they do all over the world when the state's in control. And then they can coercively end your life, and they can say it's no big deal, no consequences allowed. We're saying the state never has that right because your life is precious, even if you and I disagree. And what blew me away is they all looked at each other and said, we used to believe that. We didn't think you could anymore. See, that's where the church needs to understand. That's its role out in the community. It's God's law that comes first, that breaks the human heart down. It's God's law that curbs, you know, bad behavior, which is where why the state's supposed to actually do something moral, you know, in, for the sake of the public good. But if you won't be that law for their sake, they'll never want to hear the gospel. Right. And if you don't use government properly to keep things civil, they'll never hear it because you'll be in the basement and it'll be illegal to come outside. Right. And so, again, we just deal with that kind of stuff on a daily basis. We're no big deal, but God's law and God's gospel is, and it gives us a wisdom that a lot of people don't have. Yeah, I, there's so much here that um, we're going to have to talk about this after the election as well, I think. <laughs> come back. Well, I hope it's going to be a good situation, but right. I, I will tell you the big issue, folks, is out there. Go vote and look at the platform. And if the platform says the state has the right to do, the state's the answer to everything, that is the thing we're fighting. Yeah, We're, we're saying the state doesn't have the right in education. The state doesn't have the right to take the uh, parental authority away from the children. The state doesn't have the right to define sex. The state doesn't have the right to find, even define marriage. And so those are the things we're fighting against. And if we lose those battles, it will prevent us from pre preaching the gospel too. I have in the show notes a uh, link to the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberties website. Uh, so uh, we can uh, point you there. You have a podcast as well. Yes. Um, the, the Liberty Action Alert podcast. I've got um, I'll, that's on that website. And uh, I've been listening to that uh, and taking that. You, you mentioned Ben Johnson's book. Uh, no, you mentioned um, Jerry Newcomb's book. Yes. I think it was Doubting Thomas. Doubting Thomas. Any other books that maybe we can uh, or or resources that that Christians can have to further not only educate themselves, but maybe to to kind of uh, motivate themselves to be a part of this yeah, process. I, I do, and I'm looking at them over there, but I can't see them. Uh, you know, there's a... The, Put the glasses on, right? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, where is that book? Well, there's a lot of good books. I mean, from a Lutheran standpoint, I always say that Robert Benny's book on um, uh, paradoxical vision is very helpful. 
because it lays out a, a, a grid of engagement. You know, when should the church speak as the church to Caesar? Most of the time, we just, you know, that's not how we engage. We're not, we're not apolitical, but we're not overly political either. We're the live and let live people, if you can imagine that. That book will help you with that. Um, What's it know, called again? Uh, paradoxical vision. You know what I'll do? I've got a, I've got a primer of, of uh, you okay. know, books, to, and I'll send you all those. Perfect. Because there are some fundamental books that if we're going to really, if we really want to get involved in this, even Metaxas's book that you talked about, I think we need to understand paradoxical vision before we read Metaxas. Okay. Because Metaxas doesn't differentiate like we do. And here's why that's important. Let me give you one last analogy. I think the work I do right now, think of a, on an offensive line, I mean, an offensive football team. The quarterback, wide receiver, and the running back, they're like the evangelists, the pastors. You, they throw the ball, they score. But on every play, there's a guy called the offensive lineman, and he blocks, and he blocks, and he blocks, and he blocks. That's my work. I never score. No one ever interviews me at the end of the football game. If we win the, t you know, it's always the quarterback. He gets all the glory of the running back, whatever. But God actually says blockers are Christian, can be Christian too. Even when you, all you do is block and put them on their back so that that guy can get through and share the gospel. So think of it in those terms, as long as you differentiate and you try to do what God says a policeman should do, what God says a, you know, a politician should do in service to the gospel, I think we'll be just fine. Right. Thank you so much, Greg. Yeah. I appreciate you taking the time in your busy, <laughs> busy schedule. So uh, I think that, yeah, I'll have you come back and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk about the aftermath of the, of the election. Well, let's, uh, let's hope it, I hope where I think it's going, <laughs> but we'll, we'll see. see. Well, well and like I said, one of the things is the black conservative movement, the Hispanic conservative movement. Uh, th it's such a beautiful thing because they're not looking to government. They're looking to themselves and to the church. And that's a beautiful movement in America. Let's just hope it keeps growing. Yeah. Either way, we'll we'll come back and we'll talk about it. Maybe we'll be a little subversive, but that's OK, too. There's nothing wrong. With Always. That. Well, it, just as soon as as soon as if I do wind up going uh, to prison, just come visit me. OK. Oh, absolutely. That's okay. Jesus said that was the thing to do. So definitely <laughs> okay. we'll do that. And Thank I will you, my be, friend, okay. Greg Seltz, Thank you. joining me on the Reflection Podcast today. Well, I hope you enjoyed this special episode of the Reflection Podcast where we talked about Christian nationalism and the upcoming elections in the United States. I wanted to talk with Greg about all of these things uh, before we go to the polls in November here in 2024. If you'd like to connect with Greg, I have in the uh, show notes uh, in the description of this podcast links to the Lutheran Center for Religious Liberty and other resources that Greg uh, talked about and has. Uh, so that you can be an informed voter as you live out your Christian life here in the United States. The Reflection Podcast is produced by St. Matthew Lutheran Church in Hawthorne Woods, Illinois. And if you find yourself in the northwest suburbs of Chicago, we invite you to join us in person for our Bible studies or our worship services or maybe one of our events. All our worship services and many of our Bible studies are streamed live on our website. You can connect with us at www.stmats.net or stmatts.net. We're also on YouTube and Facebook and Instagram. Thank you for joining me for this special episode of the Reflection Podcast. A new season will be coming out after the first of the year. So like and share and leave a review and go back and watch past episodes or listen to past episodes of the podcast so that more and more people can find out how they can reflect the light and the love of God in this dark world. Thanks for joining me today on the Reflection Podcast. <music>